Today we're talking about reflecting as routine. And this is video two in the series of new beginnings. Of course, all of this in the context of setting up and maintaining a student-centered classroom. For my part in this, if you don't know me or you're new here, I'm looking to inspire you. A science teacher who maybe has lost the fire that they once had for teaching science. It's just become boring, it's become a little doldrum, you're following a script, and probably not getting the type of individual student relationship that maybe you thought you would becoming a teacher, maybe at one point you did. I'm here to help you find all of that again, and I seek to do that by helping teachers regularly reflect on their teaching practice, because I just think this is a number one, the most important thing we could do as teachers, then to adopt active student-centered instructional strategies, and finally, where my heart is, to design and deliver interactive science lessons, lessons using free technology-based activities. In terms of my experience and what I can bring to you and just let you know that I'm not some random person out here peddling some information. I was a scientist, I was a chemist, I got a bachelor's and a master's degree in chemistry, I worked in a lab for seven years, three of which were in graduate school, uh, and then I worked in an actual industry-based lab for four years of those. And then I switched, um, I got my teaching certificate, I worked for the last 13 years at a cyber charter school. So I've been a science teacher, but my whole experience, apart from my cooperating experience when I got my certification and some adjuncting with Penn State University um, has been online. And you can appreciate that now that you've been through a pandemic year. And nine of those 13 years are spent lecturing because no one could give me a best practice for online teaching. There were none, <laughs> especially to our young ones. Um, so you had to find your own way. It was the sink or swim kind of thing. And now you've been in that world in 2020, maybe 2021, um, and, it, and in doing it in one year is kind of like impossible to get your footing and know what you need to do. Plus, your mentality might have been, I don't need to figure this out because I'm going to go back to my brick and mortar, my traditional environment. Well, I never had that luxury, so I did struggle. I rode the struggle bus. But once I switched to student-centered instructional strategies and learning from my students, I just will never turn back. This year in particular, I have two different preps, I have so many students, and a ton of different directives in terms of like increasing literacy skills and, and school-wide initiatives that I have to fit into what I've developed. And it's tough, but it's not worth me abandoning what I normally do. So I, what I'm saying to you is I'm feeling the push to just do it the easy way, to just go back to lecturing and talking at my students and it's just not worth it. Life is just so good this way. Professional life that is. Um, at one point, I did develop a store on Teachers Bay Teachers so I could sell my lessons, but I do teach chemistry. So um, while my lessons are wildly diff could be differentiated for all different grade levels and, and teachers have, um, and, and some of them are more physical science, you know, leaning, it's still too small of a pond for me to swim in. I feel like I've got a good handle on what needs to happen for our instruction to not just be interactive and engaging, but also effective. And so that we can realize achievement for and with our students. So I created some other, some other wonderful things out there on the internet. The first of which is a student-centered science teacher society, completely free. You may be watching this video um, in here or Maybe it's something you want to join up with. It's totally free. I give regular teachings. We have a lot of discussion and some resources from time to time I can share out. But then I also maintain the Active Learning Laboratory and the Digital Instructional Design Studio. Now, these are paid memberships that come with lots of tangible things to do. They are action-based. They are not purely inspiration-based. Um, libraries of video trainings, Digital Instructional Design Studio, definitely the pedagogy based, let's get this done, 
develop a curriculum membership where the active learning laboratory is definitely more for the person who just really wants to understand and tackle strategies they can implement today or tomorrow and start to shift the tide of culture in their classroom. So today I'm bringing you reflecting as routine and reflection is just the heart uh, like of what I do. I, I think in general, me personally, I tend to be a more reflective person in every aspect of my life, but I'm also a science teacher and I wanna just like have that loving science teacher moment right now because <laughs> as science teachers, whether or not you were ever a scientist yourself, a practicing scientist, you look at the world differently. You are taking in what you see, but you're doing this level of analysis with it. And analysis is reflection. So I think we have the potential to discover so much if we allow ourselves to go there. We budget in the time and the mind resources to do it. Um, this is also part of a new beginning series. So we're talking about new year, new approach. How do I get it done? It's in the context of setting goals and being organized and creating change. Uh, so I thought it very fitting to include reflection here. And I want to start with just that compare contrast between what you might be doing, teaching as telling, and, and compare to where you may want to go. So what I want to suggest to you is that when we're teaching by telling, we can really only reflect on our content. We're not really as concerned about how we're saying what we're saying, or really what the words are we're saying, or what our actions are during those 50 minutes in the classroom. We're mostly reflecting on and thinking about our sequence. In what order do these lessons belong? More of a curriculum mapping um, sort of strategy. Our pace. Ooh, did I, did I go too fast? You know, I remember being a, 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 a teacher, not yet, but I was with my cooperating, my mentor teacher, and every time I taught, she'd be like, you gotta slow down. You are going way too fast, you know, because I was teaching as telling. I was standing up there, story time, and, but the, the, the ideas that students were supposed to be imagining or recording in their notes were just too complex to be talking so fast. So, as I say, we, when we're just teaching by telling, all we can reflect on is either our stuff that we're telling or the way we're telling it. Um, maybe we're thinking about the resources and the images we're providing. So when I lectured, when I taught by telling, I rejected the fact that I was doing it because, oh, look at this great video I showed them. Look at this great demonstration I did. Look at this great, even demonstrations, folks, teaching is telling. We're just showing them they're not in it to win it, right? So I had this amazing library of curated materials and things for them to dig into, but I wasn't structuring my time with them in a way that actually required them to dig in. And therein lies the rub. We can also maybe reflect on our resources, our uh, note-taking guides, if we're giving them note-taking guides, or our worksheets, or our assessments. Anything we're giving them as supplementary to our talk. And this is very limiting. You might think to yourself, if you're watching this now and you're saying, what do I need to reflect? Well, if you're intending to move to a student-centered culture in your classroom using different strategies than talking, demonstrating, showing, then you're going to have a lot of opportunity for reflection. And that's what I want to share with you today. Your role in the classroom changes incredibly when you decide you're gonna lead a student-centered lesson, even if you do it for one day. All of your, your, your physical position in the classroom, your words that you speak, um, I mean, everything changes. You transform into a servant leader. You're no longer an authority. You're no longer delivering information. And there's a weight to be lifted here. You know, I'll talk about this maybe someday in depth. But for me, there was a huge relief in becoming that servant leader because I think 
you know, intuitively when we become teachers, it's something we expect we're going to do. It's a service job. We're devoting ourselves, most of us in the public sphere. And we're going to expect to nurture and support and guide. We don't expect to end up just talking at students. So this part actually comes naturally. And for me, when I shifted, I went, wow. I like don't feel this burden that it's my job to transmit knowledge from this brain, this brain, <laughs> to that brain. All 20, 30 of those brains. 150 of those brains. Now I just need to find a way for them to get there themselves. And for me, it was very freeing. We're all different though. As a servant leader, our role requires us to provide experiences and opportunities. Experiences that are not entirely listening and watching experiences. Not one person anyway, not at the front of the room. Experiencing science. An opportunity to execute science. We also must encourage independence. As a student-centered model, we are concerned with more of the student than just intellect, than just that huge base layer of um, Bloom's taxonomy, which is recalling information. Oh my goodness, when I do reach something in my chemistry curriculum where I have to say, you, you do I have to just know this, it hurts me <laughs> because I know that we can get students to a point where they can reason themselves from A to B and B to C and C to the end. But there are some facts that they do unfortunately just have to know. Um, but independence is a soft skill. Independence is a life skill. Independence is not recalling information. And so how do we achieve that? What do we do in the classroom differently to make that happen? And we also want to increase their confidence. If you're out there listening to me, chances are you've heard more than one student say, science isn't my thing. I'm horrible at science. I don't do math and science well. I mean, I teach 10, 11, 12th graders, so I maybe hear it more than you if you're a middle school teacher, or certainly if you're an elementary school teacher and you're watching. Um, our elementary little kiddos, they may not have already lost their independence. Actually, they're, they're trying to be, get basic independence, right? Not, not rekindle their independence. Um, but they might have not lost their confidence yet. Uh, with teenagers, we definitely work against the grain there. And in, in, in student-centered strategies, we have the opportunity to fix what someone else broke. Oh, and I'm, it makes me, lights me up. I'm just so happy to be here help, helping, helping the world do this. So what does that involve? We're going to transform students, individuals, and whole classrooms. What does that mean? Why reflect? We're going to reflect because reflection creates, supports, and enables change. In a former video, I talked about how teachers can mature and transform like trees can mature and transform. And I want you to keep that in mind. If you haven't watched that video, go back, go back and study up on it. Reflection also allows us to aim for excellence. Honestly, if I had to pick one big thing that reflection does, maybe this is my number two, because I do have a number one. <laughs> and it's not this, but I think it's number two. If we're not interested in getting better, we are not going to bother spending the time thinking about where we've been or what we've done. Reflection reinforces our purpose. It reminds us why we're doing what we're doing and make sure that all the actions we're taking are in fact leading to or generating or supporting that which we've decided is our guiding light. And here's my number one. The ultimate ultimate is reflection produces learning. We know this as teachers. This is not astounding, but it's so easy in our day to day to get caught up in The day-to-day, -day, the lunch duty, the bus duty, the kid who just skinned his knee, <laughs> the kid who's being bullied, um, you know, keeping our lesson plans updated in our school system, 
all the little things that we forget or we don't have time to use our brain power and just go, what worked? What didn't work? And how can I get better? But it's so important. Here's what I'm going to propose to you is the cycle of teacher reflection in a student-centered model. It's going to start with determining your purpose. And I've talked about that in the former lesson, Creating Change. So we do have to assume that we're starting there and you know why we need to determine a purpose because it's career changing. Then we need to plan a lesson with that purpose in mind. Our lesson planning isn't now only focused on content. What am I teaching? But the how I'm teaching it, the incorporation of experiences and opportunities is going to reinforce that purpose. After we plan the lesson, we need to deliver the lesson. So we got it. So I can tell you as countless times I've planned a lesson. I'm going, this is a killer lesson. I can't wait to teach it. And then I delivered it. And it fell flat. What is wrong? What, what did I do wrong? What And what can I do better for next time? It's not a garbage lesson. There's, there's something in here that can be tweaked. And then after we review, deliver a lesson in a student-centered lesson, an interactive one, we can review artifacts. We can review what the students did and make decisions based on that. If you hear a lot in your, uh, hear a lot in your podcasts or your teachings or your PD or you read a lot in blogs about data-informed decision-making as a teacher, and you are just lecturing, you are assuming that data is coming only from assessments pretty much exclusively. But it shouldn't be. We should be able to collect evidence every day, which serves as data that can inform us for the next day, not just the next week or the next unit or the next big test, but every day. And then those artifacts go back to our purpose. Did I achieve in this lesson science as practice? Did I increase their confidence in the way I delivered it? Did I increase their independence in the way I planned it? And did they have an authentic and unique experience and opportunity? What you don't want to do is think about all that only once at the end. You don't want to go, okay, I got my purpose. I can't wait to get started. I'm ready to go. Plan a lesson, deliver the lesson, review the artifacts, and then go, how did we do? Reflection as routine here, I'm going to propose to you, is not once in this cycle. It's at every single stage. It's at the stage where we say, okay, I am planning this lesson. How does it complement my purpose? What do I really need them to know and do? Okay, I've planned the lesson. I'm delivering the lesson. Or I'm ready to deliver the lesson. How am I going to do this? Am I going to use small groups? Am I going to have independent work time? Are we going to work through this as a class? Um, are students going to access a simulation or a video or a text? Am I going to let them sit on the floor and get comfy cozy? Or are they going to have to be rigid in their seats? There is... A lot of classroom management that actually gets tackled just in the reflection of how am I going to deliver a lesson that I've planned to complement my purpose. And then, of course, we're going to review it the next place after I've delivered the lesson. Maybe before you even, I mean, I can tell you as soon as I shut off a class, a recording, I... Um, a live class. I teach live classes, but we do record every session. And as soon as I shut it down, I, I have a sense of how it went. When I first did this my very first year, I mean, I held my breath through every single lesson. And I was just like, mm, how'd it go? You know, what was that like? Some days it was a huge relief and I could have a party and I felt so good. <laughs> and other days I was like wanting to give up. True story, for sure. And then you review the artifacts. Right? So you think about how can I deliver this differently? Sometimes you got to do it the next day. Um, and then you review the artifacts and you say, well, next year, next time I teach this, 
because maybe this, maybe planning, delivering, it all went well. But oh, what about the student outcome? How did they do? And what what can I emphasize next year that that I didn't this year? And so that's more of a maybe a long term piece. Do I even want to include this next year? You know, after you review the artifacts, it is more of a summative type of reflection, but. It's absolutely necessary to take a look at all of these. And, and again, that's because you're planning with the student in mind, with bigger purposes, bigger outcomes, not just can they pass the test? Can they recall what I've shared with them? So revisiting those big things, we wanna provide experiences and opportunities. We wanna encourage their independence and we wanna increase confidence. And yeah, I'm a high school teacher, but I just wanna say again, this is not a high school thing. Our little ones need confidence and independence. Our middle schoolers, if we can intervene at that age and boost them there, we have so much more promise for their success, academic success in the harder, uh, in the more challenging, more specific science coursework. What I have found is students get run over in middle school. That's really where the mentality shifts from this elementary mindset, this early learning theory where students do and process and they're creating connections and we let them do that and we ask them, would you learn? And that's all there is to it. And then in middle school, it's all about testing and information and am I right or wrong? And that's where they learn to be right or wrong. And oh, I'm right at science all the time, so I'm good at it. I'm wrong at science all the time, so I'm bad at it. If, if for those of you listening who are middle schoolers, I so like congratulate you for being here because I feel like you hold the key to an easier transition, an easier success for those of us who teach those, those higher level specific courses in the high school. Anyway, um, in terms of reflecting as routine and hitting these big points, what are we going to reflect on besides our planning process and delivery process and, and all that's actually happening with a specific lesson? We want to be able to reflect on how we can make it happen. The amount of planning time we have or that we can create. Because what I just described to you, the very first step after making your purpose is making a plan. And delivering the lesson is about having the plan and getting the artifact comes from the plan. So can you devote more of yourself to planning time? What would it take? You know, these are just questions you're asking yourself. That's all reflection is. How can I make this work? And one of them is going to be planning time that you're going to consider. Another, speaking from experience, is inspirational resources to keep you more resilient to keep you from quitting, not quitting teaching, but from quitting this commitment that maybe you're deciding to make or you have made to go down this other road. Um, I used to keep my very first year, I had a Christian planner and I would flip a, you know, flip a page and there would be a Bible verse. And, and I'm not kidding you, there were some days they were just so well-timed. You know, I wanted to cry and it said, she will not fail. Score one for me. These days, I keep um, an inspirational calendar on my desk that says, you are a badass. <laughs> because I need to be told that's true sometimes. You need to think about your response to unexpected changes. Because when you're lecturing, when you're delivering, and your teaching is telling you are in control, you're in the driver's seat. Unless your mind has like a little blip, it's all good. But in student-centered learning, you're giving the learning to the students. They've got the independence. And you have to know how to respond when, uh-oh, Wi-Fi went down. Um, uh, this is a problem for me, right? Uh-oh, the platform doesn't work. We're all logged into the same space. It's, it's an issue. Or um, you're doing something tactile, hands-on, liquids and solids. Something spills. Um, when 
whatever the change might be. Another big change that was catastrophic for me at first was veering from the big plan, the pacing, the year plan. When a lesson would fail, I knew that it was not part of my purpose to move on beyond it just because, oh, that didn't go so well. And it's really not very important to my end goal. It was, it was just a really cool lesson and a great idea. So I can say, no, <laughs> I had to go back and do it again. And I had to sacrifice whatever that next lesson day was and whatever the plan I had for giving this, 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 homework, test, whatever. Um, how do you deal with unexpected changes? Question mark. It's nothing more said. <laughs> Maybe you're great with it. I am not. You want to think about your options for differentiation and which students might need it. So in that planning process, when we're evaluating how did it go, delivery, how did it go, artifacts, you're going to you're going to so quickly learn your students and what they really can do and where they stumble and specifically how they're stumbling. And you're even going to find out when stuff is not good at home or when stuff is not good with friends or when there's just something on their mind or maybe it's a true medical thing. You know, they're on medication and it wasn't tuned quite right today or they missed it the night before. I mean, you're going to know your students so well by the work they begin to produce in only a month's time that you're going to start to diff plan for differentiation. So it becomes customary that you go, how else can I do this for that student? And what else can I plan in the same lesson for my high achieving, really fast student who's always done before everybody else? And they don't even belong in this class, but there's nowhere else they could go. And then finally, your feedback frequency and approach or style. That means how often do you touch point with your students? How often are you willing to touch point with your students? Because in a student-centered classroom, effortless, you're going to touch on most of them every day. And if not every day, then definitely every week. I would say probably every one twice a week. Individually. Hey, Joey, that's really great. You know, I'm talking praise. We're trying to increase confidence, right? We're trying to encourage independence. We're letting them know we're there. We're going to redirect them if something goes awry. And it's okay for it to go kind of weird. We're going to ask those probing questions that we've learned to ask through lecture. We know the questions to ask. It's just that the students aren't like doing the thing that makes the questions meaningful to them. It's instead presented as more of a means of recalling information. So uh, consider your feedback frequency and how you want to be that nurturing mentor to your students. These are things I think about regular, and it's just a short list. Just a short list. In the Active Learning Laboratory, I want to take just a minute and share with you that, you know, this is so important to me. It's step one in the Active Learning Laboratory in terms of um, a, a series of steps you can take to make this transition to full on, I'm going to be a student-centered science teacher, and I want to also say in a year's time or a month's time or a few months time, I'm not turning back. This is amazing and awesome. I am on fire for teaching. Uh, there's multiple resources in there for teachers to adequately reflect, and some of it is just feel-good person stuff. Um, there's something in there called a finding fulfillment journal for science teachers where, you know, it's important for us to focus on, I listen, I believe if you're listening to me, your career is important to you. Either serving students in the best way you can to be a servant is important to you or just being your own best self is important to you. And, and really, that's what this journal is about. It's about exploring your career and what more you can do with it uh, or what different you can do with it. Maybe it's not student-centered learning. Maybe you're going to discover something else entirely. Um, there are, I think, a month's worth of prompts here if you were to work on them every day, approximately 30. You can see they're, they're separated into kind of different categories, focusing on your positive, your potential, your dreams. And the next step. So we're talking about like, what's good? It's an inventory of your strengths. And the potential is what could be better or different in a way that would give you more. What is your true potential in this role or some other role? Uh, what's your dream for your classroom? What did you think you were going to do when you stepped out of college? And then how can we act on all of that? 
that's there for you. It's a permanent product in the Active Learning Laboratory, which you can join at any time. There's also a journal in there called Preparing Our Classrooms and Ourselves. Now, this is a journal that in the Active Learning Laboratory, I do recommend teachers work through as they study the on-demand video content. It ranges from, um, you know, a reflection on planning to the, your commitment to ideas of accountability and celebrating success, uh, not giving up too quick, getting comfortable with discomfort, understanding the challenges you have ahead, and there's like several questions related to each of these pinpoints. The Active Learning Laboratory, remember, meant as a space for you to learn what this is all about, reflect on yourself, learn what student-centered learning and instructional strategies really entail, and then go one step further and act on it with a lesson plan And if, if you're feeling like it's right for you. And so there's even more, um, your current practice reflection and inventory of what you might need to get started, um, how often you already do the things that are in the lesson plan that you've downloaded uh, that I use as my guiding light every day. So lots and lots of great reflective stuff for you in there. And free tool for everyone, you know, if you ever want to get a more deep look into what the Active Learning Laboratory delivers for you, that three-step action plan, um, in the featured section, I think, of our bulletin board is always there for you to access. And that's in our community.lab in every lesson location. Now, I want to go back for a minute because all I've talked about so far is teacher reflection. But I didn't say this was only about teacher reflection. The title of our talk today is Reflecting as Routine. Teachers, maybe students too. Let's look again at what reflection does. It creates, supports, and enables change. It allows us to aim for excellence, and it reinforces our purpose while producing learning. Gee, I think our students need to do all that too. So all this works with students too. And as the leader of the pack here, we have to make sure it's happening. Because we want them to change in a positive way. We want them to aim for excellence. We want them to reach their goals and their purposes. And we absolutely need them to learn. So some places where this can be accomplished, where you can lead and model this for them, is a number one in the lesson plan that I've shared you. So in this lesson plan, there are two components that I feel are very reflective. The very first one is a warm-up activity. In my practice, I call it review and preview. And if you look closely, there's two bullet points, two little um, radio buttons there that say activates prior knowledge and integrates prior knowledge. But prior knowledge is the key. So we're going back. We're reflecting on something we learned somewhere. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in a book. You can really change it up. And in doing so, you really can increase student confidence and independence because they'll believe they can do it because they'll know they've encountered some of these things before. They don't have to think, gee, where did I learn that? And then also in the data analysis area, if you're incorporating data analysis in most of your lessons, and I'm not talking quantitative analysis, folks could be qualitative analysis. We're gonna do an activity, we're gonna collect observations. What do we do with observations in our normal life? We say to ourselves, hmm, I wonder why that's there. Gee, all of those things are the same and they're all in the same place. What can I come away with? This is the piece that's giving us our uncovering core ideas. This is the piece that's giving us our cross-cutting concepts of science, according to the NGSS, where we're discovering patterns and we're looking at the use of systems and how, how models are used to describe systems, cause and effect, and all the things. It's reflection on the activity and the outcome and the artifact. All of these things, both of these things, support, enable, change, reinforce, purpose, produce learning. And if you want a deeper dive into this template, there are in the Active Learning Laboratory, there is an entire step three is devoted to understanding this lesson plan template a little bit more, but it's in the Digital Instructional Design Studio that I create a science out of this template. So if you wanna know all the things 
be most effective and get some oversight, some help, some feedback from me on, on your work, that's the place to be. Now, after a lesson, you might encourage students to do some metacognition, just like I have suggested that you do for most of this video. Um, at the end of a lesson, share with them all the success criteria, all the things they should have been able to accomplish as you had planned, and then indicate so simply, I know this, I can do this, or I can explain this. Now this is student talk for Bloom's Taxonomy. Can I give it back to you? I know it. Can I answer a simple test question, multiple choice? I know it. Can I do it? Maybe there is some problem solving or some task involved as it pertains to a science practice. Can they actually observe, record, extract ideas? Um, and I can explain this to someone who knows nothing about it. I can tell them what I learned today. And on a range of three stars, you know, color and how many stars work for you. And I would say you can do this in multiple ways. You can have students keep their own notebook or journal where you provide them with, you know, fresh examples of this and they tape them into their journal. Or you could use it as an exit ticket each and every day if you want to do like a daily reflection. Uh, or you can collect and review it. You know, I see merit to both. Maybe you do a mix. If students know they're not being looked at, sometimes they're a little bit more honest with themselves. You know, dear diary, you ladies out there, maybe gents too, they used to have a key and a lock. <laughs> and we live in a world of passwords. We don't like to share our innermost things. So I think there's super value here in, in allowing them to keep it private. It might depend on the age level. You know, because I'm talking to a range out there, K to 12, uh, you may also want to collect and review it because that could give you some insight as well. You're always looking to collect your own student-based data to make decisions. Um, I would encourage that you include success criteria for each lesson that are both activity-based and assessment-based. And when you do that, you are also reinforcing your purpose as a student-centered science teacher that you're going to provide experience and opportunity. It's not just about the test. Assessment-based success criteria, can they do these things that will be on the test? They're often very different from our activity-based success criteria. And again, this is going to vary widely because in the elementary and even in the middle school levels, we might be really focused on behavior during active learning time. Um, and maybe that's even one of our success criteria. You know, I just believe classroom management falls into place when our plan is solid. When we use that template, we use resources like this one. And we involve students in the process. This is involving students in the process in a major way, giving them agency, which is so important and also something I talk about in the Active Learning Laboratory. Now, I want you to know every month in the Active Learning Laboratory, add a new resource. Some of those resources will become concrete and stay there as part of the library forever. Some of them will be fleeting and they'll be moved to the digital instructional design like a vault. I will never remove them entirely. I always want everyone to have access to them. Um, I'm thinking this one's a keeper. I think it's very, very important. It will probably fall in that area of um, talking about the lesson plan template and success criteria. Or um, there's another place where it would fit and I don't recall just now. But if you're in there, and you're looking for this, it's not uploaded just, it depends on when you're watching, right? But very soon they will be added. As a PDF, if you're an elementary school teacher and you're like, just gonna scribble out some things, make it super simple for the kiddos, put it in the photocopier, cut them out. Um, however, I'll also give you my Canva link because if you're like me, you like, like it to be neat and pretty and you might wanna go in there and actually type your success criteria so that they're readable because they are teeny tiny lines. Um, and then there's a Google form. I live in the cyber world. I mean, I couldn't do the paper thing. So I want to service everybody here. It's absolutely true that the Google form will make your data analysis of this kind of effortless um, because you'll just be able to see the results and in, in easy without like thinking too much. We don't like to think too much, right? But um, also um, I like ed tech. It's my jam, and that's why I do the whole digital instructional design thing. So I think whatever we can use technology is a great thing to do. But like I said, we're talking K through 12 here, and 
everything works differently for everyone. Okay, I'm gonna end on this note that we can actually do teacher reflection of our students' reflections. So besides that, what I just talked about, if you're collecting and reviewing them, certainly you're doing that, but maybe even consider if you don't already, surveying your students. This is something I do like regular and always have because as a student growing up, I, I did, you know, I never felt like I had a say and I didn't probably need one, but then I went to college and you would get a course evaluation. And I was like, hmm, how come I didn't get to say anything about this in high school? Um, because you were paying for it in college, that's why. But why not? Why not give our students an opportunity to, to share like that? So I wanna give you some examples of that type of reflection. Um, this one that I'm showing you is an example of just when I do something new. Our school adopted text-dependent analysis two years ago. It's been a long haul to get all the wrinkles ironed out and to be sure that I am doing my job, that I, ha I had to create my whole, uh, whole nother mindset <laughs> to do TDA, okay? And create a purpose for myself that I could believe in and get behind. And I did, and so I might teach TDA a little differently to my students. And so I wanna know what, what they felt about it. And this one specifically was about one particular TDA called Airbag Engineering. Um, questions like, did you complete it? Briefly explain what you learned. How difficult did you feel part one was to answer? Um, specifically, which question was most difficult for you? Now, you might be thinking, you should be able to tell that from the actual student artifacts they submitted. And yeah, I can, but feelings aren't fact. A student could do really well, get 100% in A, and still feel like it was hard, and still feel like there was a most difficult question. So there's value in tapping into feelings if you're going for that whole holistic thing and truly serving your students and making them the center of your plan and your delivery. Um, and you could see it's, it's sort of more the basic thing. Now, I also give a quarterly reflection. We do marking periods at my school and I tell them when you get a grade, I get a grade. I give them the same, same uh, survey every quarter because I wanna see if it changes at all. And historically, it really hasn't. Um, I ask them about class. You know, I want them to recognize when somebody asks you, oh, how do you like chemistry? It's more than just the stuff you're learning. Hmm. There's the class time. There's the effort that you put in. Um, and I like to ask them, how much do you think it needed? And then how much was did you demonstrate? Because you can find out some students say, it's really too much for me and I did the most I could, or it's really too much for me and I, so I really tuned out, I did nothing. Um, my thoughts about the course and live sessions. What about the resources I'm using? I heavily use this resource called CK12 and it has a whole bunch of different um, features. This is a training I intend to provide. I have to do it live. I'm prohibited from doing live session recordings of it. So there will be periods of time throughout the year I deliver this in the Digital Instructional Design Studio. Um, resources I give them, like digital notebooks uh, powered by book widgets, also something I talk about in the Digital Intru Instructional Design Studio. How do they think of me? Am I knowledgeable? Do I accommodate them? Do I challenge them? I, and I list all the things I want to know if they think about me. Some of the things I don't want them to feel are, are happening. Some of the things I do want them to feel are happening. So I don't just list things that like, yeah, you know, boost me up. And then I give them some open-ended questions at the end. I do something similar at the whole end of the year. I hope you've had a great year. I try for some specific things. Please look back on the year and let me know how it goes. Um, and similar types of questions. Look back, how much effort did you apply to the year? Um, what do you think about, you know, this was kind of more of a, a mashup of everything that I did in, in the four quarters. But, and perhaps even this year I gave, I might not have done the quarterly thing. But it's fantastic. And a lot of the student feedback that you will see me share often comes from these types of surveys. It also serves as an amazing boost when you need it because students are gonna love you. <laughs> they are gonna find your class to be just the refreshing piece of the day that they wish was happening all day long. And it feels good. It feels good to make them happy. It feels good to be fulfilling your purpose. 
anyway, that's what it is for me. <laughs> so I hope that it will be for you as well. Now in the third installment of this series, New Beginnings, we're gonna talk about setting goals and I've, t I've tossed around with making this topic a little bit more specific, setting goals for or about or what. No, I, I just wanna make it setting goals. That way we could do the same thing we did today, talk about both teacher goals and student goals and all the things. So stay tuned for that. I look forward to seeing you back here. And if you are watching on YouTube, of course, I would love for you to visit our free community, the Student Centered Science Teacher Society. Go to community.labineverylesson.com. The link is in the description below, as well as the link for the Active Learning Lab. If that's something you're interested in joining up, please subscribe and like and share this video with a friend. Thanks for watching.